those online as well. This week we're talking about a fresh start. We've got us started with that, and I'm thinking, don't take my main passage, but good job. Thanks for picking Peter. We're not going to deal with Peter. Rick already did the... We're going to be in Corinthians. We're talking about the blessing of a fresh start. So we start the new year, and there's lots of things that go along with that. There's something refreshing about a new year. The last year has been wrought with, you know, a few things. Some failures, heartaches, heart attack, disappointments. But a new year. A new year gives a clean state. We get a fresh start. We get what's done is done, right? New year, new number. A fresh beginning. The old has passed, and a new year has come with its potential, its excitement, and it has its possibilities. We don't know what will come. Probably be some good, probably be some bad, but whatever it is, God will be with us in it and through it. But the way we're going with the sermon this week is, but what kind of new will this year be for you? What kind of new will the year be for you. It'll make a little more sense, hopefully, as we get farther into the sermon. Deep down inside, we all crave what a new year seems to give. So we're going to start by talking about a clean slate, the idea of taking that and wiping it off and having no mark or memory of what was behind. We desire deep down to be given a fresh start, whether it's home, at school, at work, or at church. Many of us desire and need a fresh beginning. The world each year hopes that January 1st is going to give them a clean slate, a new start. But year in and out, they're disappointed. But this morning, we've been given an amazing gift. We've been given an incredible opportunity. We can have a clean slate because of Jesus, whom we worship. Amen. We have something that the, the world gets a new year, but in Jesus, we have a clean slate. That's one of the reasons why we worship God. He's the God of the clean slate, the new beginning, the fresh start. And the passage we're going to start with, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 21. And we're going to go back and forth in this a little bit with some other passages. But this new idea, the clean slate, where does that come from? The passage begins with, therefore, if anyone is where? Is that significant? What happens if you're not in Christ? Well, maybe changes the rest of the passage. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. To reconcile is to repair a relationship, to bring it back to a state of being together. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. And how did he do that? Not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Everyone can be right with God. There isn't anyone that's gone too far that can be restored in a right relationship to have it reconciled because of Christ. And that's because he gets to a point, he makes the decision, he is offered in his blood to pay for our sins and not hold them against us. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's an invitation that we've had out there that we are presenting we want people to be right with God. We urge them, encourage them, implore them. You can't make anyone be right with God. God made him who had no sin to be sin, or I think a better understanding of the passage, to be a sin offering for us, so that where? In him we might become the righteousness of God. The importance of being in Christ for the clean slave. Now, I marked out some other things in there with the colors. Uh, hopefully, those will make sense, why we focus on some of those words. We've been given the amazing opportunity to have our slates wiped clean through reconciliation with Jesus. Mankind has been living in a state of separation from God since the garden. We, when we sin, we separate ourselves from God. When we choose sin as our master, we need the redemption that we have in Jesus. 
this is who we are. That's the old creation, but we have the opportunity to have a new creation. We have this reunion, this reuniting with him. Paul is telling us that when we enter into a relationship with Christ, we are no longer who we were before. Our slates have been wiped clean, and we are made new. Well, how does that happen? Because verse 19 says, God is not counting men's sins against them. That's God can do that. In Christ, he cannot count our sins against us. We've been given that gift as well. The promise was encouraging to the Corinthians, and it's encouraging to us today. That means we have a free, clean slate. God has given us freedom. So we're going to look at how that freedom affects our lives deeply and supremely. What's the value of a clean slate? What part is clean? What can we remember that's been wiped away and the good brought forward? Well, we have a fresh start with a clean slate. The first aspect of that is how the clean slate frees us from our past. Talk to anybody, and they'll likely tell you something they've regretted. I wish I wouldn't have. Might not be a deep regret, but that was something that I shouldn't have done, something that they feel guilty for. We all have a past, and for many people that past not only haunts them once, but hangs around and haunts them constantly. Sometimes it haunts them their whole lives. There are people who never move forward for fear of the past. The past is a powerful force in our lives. Christ told us then when we're reconciled to him and when he gives us a clean slate, we're free from our past. That verse 19 image that we have been in the state of not having our sins counted against us. In Psalm 103, 12, the psalmist declares that as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgression from us. Even if you look of how far east coast of Canada from west coast of Canada, is that a distance? Even that's a pretty good distance so far as your sins have been removed, but east and west will never touch. They are gone. They are out of view. They don't connect anymore. There's passages where he made this promise to the nation of Israel who had messed up so bad that they're going to go into exile. We've looked at the importance of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse 20, God says to the nation, in those days at that time, declares the Lord, search will be made for Israel's guilt, but there will be none for the sins of Judah, but none will be found. God was able to say, I will put them away completely the sins of the whole nation or what about Isaiah 44 22 God declares I have swept away your offense like a cloud your sins like the morning mist so if God's not holding them against them learn from the mistake make better choices but the clean slate from the past gives us the opportunity to move forward God has given us forgiveness, and because of that, we're set free from the past. In God's eyes, when we come to him, we truly repent and seek to be reconciled with them. He forgives us. Like the psalmist says, he removes our sins as far as from the east, from the west. That's an amazing freedom that we have been given. Instead of carrying the weight of our past on our shoulders, Christ wants us to come to him and to take that burden. He casts our past from us and remembers them no more. We are free from our past. That is the negative parts of our past. The victories, the challenges, the, oh, the victories that you've overcome, the person that you've come from the past can carry forward. But the guilt, the shame, the suffering, the pain, bring the value of it forward, but leave the destructive part in the past. We have a clean slate. We have that opportunity but God doesn't just give us a clean slate from the past. He gives us a clean slate in our present. Our clean slate frees us from present sin. So Romans chapter 6 verses 15 through 18 is a passage that talks about being free from sin. Being free from the master of sin. That sin is a master over us. So in verses 15 through 18 it says, What then shall... Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? 
by no means. Don't you know that when we offer our, yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you're slaves to the one you obey, whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves. It is not freedom for freedom's sake, but now you're a slave to righteousness. Sin can't control you anymore because you are dedicated to serving God in righteousness. That's your master. Paul talked about how we've been given new life by the grace of God. We're no longer under the law. We live under grace. Paul says that Christ set us free from the slavery of sin, but that doesn't allow us to be autonomous. Paul basically says we're always serving somebody. Christ has given us freedom from slavery of sin and death and enable us, encourage us to serve him. We have been given the amazing gift of freedom from sin. We are no longer slaves to sin, but we're able to follow wholeheartedly after God. We can now live in moment-by-moment -moment obedience to him, free from the bonds of sin in our lives. We are free from our present sins. We have continually access to a clean slate. Not just our past, but even our present won't be held against us. That clean slate not only frees us from our past and our present, the clean slate gives us freedom to live a life of worship. Doesn't it? Because you know the good things you carry forward and Satan can't accuse you of the past because it's gone. So now we have the freedom to worship. A clean slate of worship. So Romans chapter 12. See, I told you we'd get back to Romans. You can't get far from it. Romans chapter 12, 1, gets to the heart of the idea, well, what is worship? Well, we have a number of passages we could have looked at, right? But therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Worship is not just an emotional response. I come to worship, but I am a person of worship. It's a lifestyle. Worship is taking your everyday life, regular life, and giving it to God as an offering because God is worthy of our focus and our attention. Worship is related to the word worthy. Is God worthy of your focus? Yes. Focusing on God is worship. But because he's given us a clean slate from the past, from the present, we are people who can worship. Jesus wants to give us a new life. Do you have that opportunity? Do you have that opportunity this morning? Maybe you've been here before. Maybe you've come to Christ and been cleansed. Maybe you've been given a clean slate, but in time it got dirty. It's become grimy. Maybe you've never accepted the clean slate that God offers. You've never experienced the overwhelming joy of being set free or having your past expunged. Do you like that word? Expunged. Not used against you. Written out of the record. Not accessible. Or being set free to live in obedience. You don't have that freedom to worship because your past, your present, your sin is in the way of open, honest worship. So this year and today, I invite you to make the dedication that you want Christ to give you a new life, to give you a new slate. You want to be set free, open, ready for worship. It's a perfect time of year to make a new beginning, wouldn't you say? Fresh start. But what kind of new? Second part of the sermon. We use the word new in a couple different ways. So did the Greeks. The difference is they used two different words. So if somebody says, I bought a new car, what could that mean and how would you know? I bought a new car. I didn't. I bought a new radiator <laughs> for a 2003 van. What can you mean by that? New to you. Okay. Could be something that's new to you. I bought a new car. 
How else can, what else can that mean? Brandy. That's my brother. <laughs> yeah, somebody, other people, I've heard of other people that say these things. I bought a brand car, like a brand new car, or first off the line, or a never been seen before type of car. It's, it's a new car. See, we use the word two different ways. So what kind of a new year is it? Is it new to you? Or is it a new type of year? Well, the Greeks use the same thing in two different directions. And so when they talk about it, is this a year with a new number and very little difference? Or is it a new type of year with a different quality and nature from the old? Is this a, I'm entering a new type of year. I'm going to be a new type of person. Or is this a, I'm entering 2024, which is the same as 2021, which is same as... You know, it's just a new number, but really nothing's going to change type of year. The difference between the two is found in the transformative power of Jesus. Amen and amen. You can just have a new year. You just get a new number. But if you want a new life, a new hope, a new person, a new year, that's something Jesus can provide. He can transform it into a type of year that you haven't experienced before. So neos, the first Greek word, recent in time. So this is new as in the next, but it's pretty much the same as before. Um, it's more recent in time, but that's really the only change in it. So it could refer to wine that had been recently made or wineskins that were fresh and supple. We read that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke about the wine and wineskins. They're new, but had nobody ever seen a wineskin before? No, they're not that type of new, but they're fresh. Uh, there's a fresh batch of yeast. There's Young people are called naos, the new ones. Do you like that term? They are the new ones. I think that's kind of funny. The prodigal was the younger. He was the newer of the sons, which is a different way of looking at it. Uh, Timothy and Titus received guidance from Paul on the best ways to minister to younger men, newer men, and newer women. We don't tend to think of younger people as newer, but in a way they are. But Colossians 3.10 explains that a believer has put on a neo-self. You have a new self, a new version of you that you didn't possess before you came to Christ. You have a new, a newer, refreshed self. It's one of the ways neos is used. But kainos, this is the cool one. Neos is just new. But kainos is new as in not seen before. Different nature from the old. Something that's not been previously used. The tomb that Jesus was put in was a new tomb. But a second hand tomb or a brand new tomb. It was brand new. Never been used. Mars Hill. They were waiting for a new idea. Here's an idea that we've never heard before. It's superior to the old. People were amazed at his new teachings. Do you realize Jesus' teachings were called new teachings? We've never heard this before type of teachings. It's not same old, same old from a different person. It's a new type of teaching because it was accompanied by miracles and healings. And it had authority that other teaching didn't have. There's a specific instance where Naos and Kainos overlap, and it's in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews, the new covenant in Hebrews 12.24 is Naos because it came 1,500 years later than the covenant with Moses. Makes sense? So there's the old covenant, older than, and the newer covenant came later in time. It's newer. But that, it's also referred to as a new kind of covenant relationship. In Hebrews 8.8, 8, 13 and 9 15 because it was different but the focus in Roman in Hebrews is that it was superior this isn't just a newer one a younger one it's a superior one what do we have in Jesus that's new 
that's of a different kind. We have a new commandment to love one another. That's a different kind of love because it's based on the love of Jesus. Has mankind ever been asked to love people like God loves people? No. Not that type of love. He created the church as something, what? Of a new kind. It's distinct. We become a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Is that just younger? No. It's a new kind of creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 He created us as a new self made in his likeness. That's new. It's unique. It's never been there. And it's far superior. In Revelation, we're going to get a new name, a new kind of name, a new way of being introduced. We're going to sing a new song. We'll spend eternity in a, this is an important one, not just a different kind of heaven and earth, but a far superior new type of heaven and earth. There's a reason that kainos is in that passage. And we'll live in a new Jerusalem. Not like an old Jerusalem, not just a younger version of Jerusalem. It will be a new Jerusalem. And at the end of the time, there is this promise in Revelation chapter 21, 5. He, was, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making, what's the next word? Everything. What? Of a new kind. Isn't that powerful? At the end of time, God says, I am making absolutely everything of a new kind. Because the physical will be gone and the spiritual will be left. Everything will be transformed to a new kind of. They understood these differences in the words. I wanted us to remind us at the beginning of the year that we have a clean slate. We have a fresh start. We have a new life. And when God makes things new, our jaws will drop with wonder. And in the end, he's going to do it with everything. Isn't it amazing in God's creativity what he can come up with and make it even better? Even more amazing. Let me surprise you with this type of God. What kind of new year do you want to have? Do you want just a 2024 year? Or do you want a new, transformative, haven't, haven't lived that way before, haven't thought that way before, you know what, this is different. Well, the change is in Jesus. And Jesus is ready for the transformation. He's ready to give us a type of year that we have not seen before, that we've not experienced but how will we join him in the transformation process? He's not going to do it to us, but he will do it with us. Do we want it to be transformed to be more like Christ? This year is going to be a hopeful one. That's the next series. We're going to get into that next week. What are the traits of hopeful? Is hopeful one of the descriptors of your year? What do you hope for? What do you look forward to? What's the difference between wishful thinking and hope? If you want a new year with a new type of life, with a new focus being changed by Jesus, hope is going to be a significant part of that. Join together in that series as well.